Lord of Mysteries 2, Circle of Inevitability. Chapter 646, Indoor Fight. Twanaku Tupion's ears rang, his eyes stinging with blood. His mind burned, his thoughts scattering like sparks. For an agonizing moment, he couldn't process his situation, couldn't even think about the enemy closing in. Blood, smelling strangely metallic, trickled from his eyes and nose. His pale skin darkened ominously. Ha! Lumian spat a blast of pale yellow light, hitting the suspected Hisoka from barely two meters away. Twanaku's eyes slammed shut and he collapsed. Before he hit the ground, Lumian's symphony of hatred, a black bone flute, jabbed towards his neck. Instantly, the tiled bathroom floor dissolved into a vast, muddy expanse of darkness. Arms burst upward. Some were stripped of skin, all raw muscle and glistening tendon. Others twisted and ghostly, pale and transparent. Some bore bulging eyes that spun madly, others sprouted thick green growths. The grotesque limbs tore at Lumian and Twanaku, clawing and dragging. This was Twanaku's spell, a death-type enchantment once called Vengeful Wraith's Entanglement, meant to summon an undead horde to paralyze his targets. But as a mid-sequence bayonder of the Devil Pathway, his power twisted the spell into something new the Fallen Abyss. He could alter a space in advance, allowing undead or fallen creatures to lurk beneath the surface. Anyone unfortunate enough to step inside would be grabbed by unseen arms and dragged into the muddy, pitch-black depths. The abyss would slow and weaken its victims, the icy touch of the undead stealing their strength with agonizing speed. If they were pulled all the way under, they'd be corrupted and lost. Twanaku had cast this spell in the bathroom before attacking Kolobo. He hadn't wanted any nosy employees or customers to stumble on the scene, but it turned out to be a lucky break. That's why he'd appeared in the mirror instead of right inside Kolobo's eyes. Lumian's attack with the Symphony of Hatred came to an abrupt halt. Countless arms wrapped around his ankles, calves, hips, and torso. A wave of icy stiffness washed over him, his movements turning sluggish. It was the same for Twanaku. With the wraith and desire apostle unconscious, the fallen abyss slipped from his control, leaving him vulnerable. His limp body was seized by the strange arms and dragged to the ground. Nearby, Kolobo, badly injured and out for the count, was pulled into the muddy, pitch-black depths of the illusory abyss. A burst of crimson flames exploded from Lumian's body, surrounding him like a blazing cloak. The flames roared, scorching most of the arms into retreat. Still, some remained unaffected, their grip relentless. A creeping coldness numbed Lumian's body, but he regained a sliver of his former agility. Before, he could have simply lunged forward, thrusting the black bone flute towards his enemy's neck. But now, the target the one he believed was Hisoka was about to vanish into the ground. Thud, Twanaku slammed into the ground, the impact jarring him awake. The spell of Harem's grip faded, and he finally regained his senses. His toughest moment, that relentless surge of desire, was behind him. Lumian lowered his head, a single scornful sound escaping him. HMPH. Twin beams of white light shot out, while Lumian retracted his hands, fingers slipping back into his traveler's bag. The beams missed their mark, but horrifying bloody arms sprouted from the ground, a gruesome forest that blocked Twanaku from their path. With a flash of awareness, Twanaku seized control of the Fallen Abyss spell, shielding himself and attacking his enemy. The arms hit by the spell of Harumph softened, sinking back into the pitch black mud as if drained. Twanaku took his chance. His body twisted, morphing into a dark, oozing malevolence, a shape born from the darkest shadows of his heart. Silently, Twanaku transformed into an illusory, viscous and foul black liquid, merging with the muddy abyss and vanishing. The evil arms, unfazed by the flames, clung to Lumian, limiting his movement. His hands flew to his traveler's bag, pulling out a suit of gleaming silver armor. He set the armor beside him, sinking it firmly into the pitch-black mud. Pride armor, evil, writhing arms erupted from the illusory abyss and the corresponding spirit world. 
Guided by the spell, they lunged for the pride armor, seizing its ankles, legs, torso, and back. The pride armor struck back, a broadsword of pure light flashing in its hand. Blinding, holy light flooded the washroom. The shadowy arms recoiled with hisses of black smoke, retreating into the depths. The pitch black mud dissolved, revealing the bathroom's stone tiles. Kolobo, who'd been on the brink of sinking into the abyss, lay unconscious on the floor. Just meters away, near the washroom door, a figure of viscous black liquid prepared to flee. Now free, Twanaku came to a swift decision. He wouldn't waste time trying to possess Lumian Lee. Instead, he'd abandon the Matani import and export shop and port pylos. It was a trap. He had to escape before it closed around him. Staying to fight back was foolish, he couldn't risk lingering just to satisfy his rage and murderous desire. That would be far too dangerous. Twanaku was glad he'd chosen to give Lumian Lee those two gifts. He'd even divided his favorite mystical items to do it. The patrol team should be in chaos by now, focused on a false target. The distraction would give him his chance to escape. Before, Twanaku hadn't been focused on killing Camus. His priority was taking out Kolobo and escaping. If everything went smoothly, there shouldn't be problems for either side. Any chaos caused by Camus's death would be a bonus, distracting the enemy by having the other passing off as the real deal. He'd sent that extra gift as a precaution, not some bloodthirsty urge. In Camus's office, nestled inside the patrol team's beige four. Story building, a poker card shimmered with metallic light as it hurtled towards him. Coffee was the last thing on his mind. He dove behind his desk with a surge of adrenaline, planning to send the table flying back at so before blasting him with psychic piercing. The Joker faced card sword over Camus's head, missing its target. But then, as if it had a mind of its own, the card swerved and plunged down, aiming for Camus's back. It seemed to melt right into him, vanishing in a flash. So's grin stretched wider. He strode to the desk, yanking the broadsword from his back. Inside the men's bathroom of the Matani import and export shop, a figure made of thick, black liquid slipped through the crack under the door, then strangely reformed in its original spot. Bottle of Fiction the moment Lumian harbored malice and took out the symphony of hatred from the traveler's bag, Lumian had used this bathroom vent as a base, using the bottle of fiction to set one condition. Only females could enter or exit. That way, innocent customers wouldn't stumble into the dangerous Bayonder battle, and Hisoka couldn't escape without destroying the bottle of fiction first. The black, liquid figure spread toward the vent, dodging the two white beams from Lumian. Twanaku was done with dodging. His body swelled and warped, transforming into a monstrous giant almost three meters tall. The monster's skin turned a dull, dark shade, and a pair of curved goat horns marked with strange patterns sprouted from his head. Colossal bat wings wreathed in blue and crimson flames lashed out, releasing a stinging, sulfurous stench. Devil Transformation this was the signature power of a sequence six devil from the prisoner pathway, a boost to strength, speed, defense, everything. Lumian knew his target, the one he thought was Hisoka, was on high alert, braced to dodge his spell of harumph. He stopped using it. He decided against the symphony of hatred too. The situation was different. Before, his enemy had been fueled by bloodlust in his murder attempt on Kolobo, a perfect trigger. Now there was only a cold, emotionless focus, with no guarantee that the symphony of hatred would work, or that it wouldn't backfire Lumian wasn't taking that chance. Instead, a crimson spear sparked into existence. From a few meters away, he hurled it at the suspected Hisoka. The second the spear left his hand, Lumian vanished. He couldn't stay put. Possession by the wraith, a mind. Shattering psychic blast from a desire apostle, some twisted desire spell any of those were a risk. Chapter 647, Inexplicable Action In the face of the flaming spear, Twanaku's eyes, now crimson from the devil transformation, reflected dancing and burning crimson flames. He remained unfazed. Instead, he conjured an aberration a broadsword made of crimson magma and pale blue flames. 
Swiftly turning, Twanaku exposed his back to the flaming spear. With the magma broadsword in hand, he slashed at the foe who had seemingly teleported behind him, launching an attack. The broadsword, adorned with crimson magma and pale blue flames, sliced through the air but missed Lumion. It left only an exaggerated mark on the wall behind, a testament to its destructive force. Had it not been for the bottle of fiction's protection, the bathroom wall would have been split in half. Even so, the bottle visibly trembled, bearing some damage. The nearly white flaming spear also struck Twanaku's back, piercing a little before being halted by the elastic dark skin and sturdy flesh. It failed to penetrate the devil's body, leaving only blackened traces from the resulting inferno. Devils, armored in thick and tough natural protection, were resistant to flames, poison and curses to a certain extent. Twanaku, in his zombie state, possessed a steel-like body that could withstand bullets and cannonballs. Lumion's flaming spear and fireball attacks, as well as the fire raven's onslaught, posed little threat. Standing still, Twanaku could endure repeated attacks without suffering severe injuries. Additionally, his ability to transform into a wraith allowed him to evade explosions effortlessly. Hisoka Twanaku believed that, without the support of the Tarot Club, the curly-haired baboon's research society, and powerful demigods, he could have tortured Lumion to death. Even with teleportation, spells rendering him temporarily unconscious, and mystical items, most of Lumion's attacks were ineffective against wraiths and desire apostle Bayonders. The psychic shock and desire detonation further restrained him, leaving him vulnerable to the assaults of wraiths and undead creatures. Having missed his strike, Twanaku noticed Lumion's figure reappear in midair. As anticipated, Lumion had chosen to teleport behind and launch an attack. However, there was a notable change compared to previous encounters. Hovering near the ceiling and the vent, Lumion opened his mouth and emitted a harumph. The moment a pale yellow light shot out, Hisoka Twanaku's figure faded and vanished. In Lumion's pupils, a devilish figure materialized dark skin, long goat horns, bat wings on its back, and no longer wielding the sword of lava. Swiftly, Twanaku transformed into a wraith, leaping into Lumion's eyes, deftly dodging the spell of Harumph's attack. Devil transformation didn't impede his wraith abilities. Lumion's face paled, a dark green hue tinting his features. His hands involuntarily rose, reaching for his neck, and his body plummeted to the ground. Prepared for such a situation, Lumion didn't resist. While he could still struggle, he didn't halt his hands or resist the wraith's control. Instead, he sank his consciousness into his right hand. The frenzied, bloody aura of superiority dissipated slightly, causing Twanaku to instinctively tremble. He subconsciously detached from Lumion's body and leaped onto the sink. Lumion activated the black mark on his right shoulder, vanishing before crashing to the ground. This time, he appeared behind the motionless silver-white full-body armor. Behind, the pride armor spun around abruptly, raising the broadsword of light and slashing at Lumion in the not-too-small bathroom. Lumion employed spirit world traversal once more, vanishing from the silver armor's path. Within the mirror, Hisoka Twanaku was somewhat bewildered. Why did Lumion Lee provoke his sealed artifact and engage in combat with it? Am I not his enemy target? The negative effects of a sealed artifact. Though he didn't understand what was going on, Twanaku sensed danger instinctively. His danger premonition, along with a possible insight from Emperor Roselle, if something shows signs of abnormality, there must be an abnormal factor hidden. Such factors often signify danger. Without hesitation, Twanaku left the sink and leaped to the bathroom door in his colossal devil form. Conjuring a dozen or so light blue sulfur fireballs, he directed them at the wooden door in unison. Twanaku, who had shaken the bottle of fiction with his sword, knew that the current seal could be broken by brute force. There was no need to find the true exit or kill the enemy who had constructed the seal. For this reason, he chose to forego teaming up with the full body armor to assail Lumion. 
he reckoned that any further delay, even if Lumian Li were to fall on the spot, would lead to him being surrounded, facing a lethal blow with no chance of escaping alive. In such a scenario, killing Lumian Li would render the effort meaningless. Certainly, Twanaku wasn't about to let Lumian off easily. Following the sulfur fireball assault, he clenched his fists and spoke a word in devil language filled with depravity and filth. Slow. This was a manifestation of the language of foulness, capable of stiffening, and even halting the movements of targets within a 7 to 8 meter radius for approximately 2 seconds. Considering the bathroom's size, this radius covered the entire area. Lumian's form reappeared. Once more, he teleported behind the pride armor, conjuring a crimson fireball almost white in his hand. Influenced by the language of foulness, both Lumian and the pride armor moved sluggishly. One slowly launched a fireball, while the other struggled to turn around, as if its joints had rusted. Rumble, the sulfur fireballs erupted against the bathroom door. A translucent, illusory membrane materialized on the bathroom side. Like glass, it shattered inch by inch, leaving crisscrossing marks that teetered on the brink of collapse. The wooden door appeared charred and pieced together, reminiscent of a child's broken toy hastily glued back together. Observing this, Hisoka Twanaku grasped that another strike could completely shatter the seal. This time, he gathered seven to eight light blue sulfur fireballs. On the opposite end, Lumian's fireball finally collided with the pride armor's back, assisted by the explosive waves. Amidst the rumbling and clanging, the silver armor stiffened. Lumian activated the black mark on his right shoulder once more and teleported away from his current location. Almost simultaneously, the pride armor overcame the effects of slow with abnormal swiftness, swiftly turning around. However, it still couldn't lock onto its target. Twanaku felt a surge of amusement bubbling within him, but maintained an unusual vigilance. His only wish was that the relentless bombardment would shatter the seal completely, granting him an avenue for escape. In the next moment, the sulfur fireballs collided with the wooden door at the bathroom entrance. Twanaku witnessed the silver-white full-body armor squat down, driving the broadsword of light into the ground. W.H. Twanaku's pupils dilated as he instinctively readied himself to transform into a wraith. Yet he held back, exercising restraint. Aware of the potential consequences within the warrior pathway, he understood the risk of subjecting himself to even greater harm. Rumble, simultaneously with the explosion of the sulfur fireballs, the Sword of Dawn, embedded in the crevice in the stone tiles by the pride armor, disintegrated into fragments of light. Densely packed, they formed a flickering, violent and sharp hurricane that swept in all directions, filled with the intent to annihilate everything. Hurricane of Light. Since it couldn't lock onto the backstabber, it opted for a wide-ranging assault. The sharp and terrifying storm of light enveloped Twanaku and Kolobo on the ground. Lumian materialized in front of the ladder, crouched down, shielding vital points. He faced the formidable hurricane head-on. The washroom bore the brunt of the assault. The urinal was wrecked, and the cubicles silently collapsed, shedding a layer of bricks. As a depraved creature, Twanaku had nowhere to hide. All he could do was endure the damage, his eyes flickering with a sharp light. In the radiant blade storm, Lumian's figure cracked inch by inch, shattering into numerous mirror fragments. Mirror substitution. With his obstruction, Kolobo avoided fatal injuries, but couldn't escape multiple bleeding wounds. In Camus's office, within the beige four-story building housing the patrol team. Crouched behind a table, Camus's face turned pale, tinged with a dark green hue. It was as if a grayish-white clown laughed exaggeratedly in his eyes. Camus strained to ignite bolts of lightning in his eyes, piercing So's mind. His betraying teammate grimaced in pain, causing his broadsword to lose strength and direction, crashing into the desk and failing to hit Camus. In that critical moment, Camus drew a silver revolver from his right hand, aiming it not at So, but at himself. Across the street, in a room facing Camus's office, Jenna, holding a telescope, huddled by the curtain, closely monitored Camus's condition. 
Seeing the other party under attack and struggling, she swiftly grabbed the loudspeaker she had prepared and brought it to her mouth. Camus has been attacked. Camus has been attacked by the Rose School of Thought. Camus is being attacked in his office. The loudspeaker's sound reverberated through every room of the patrol team. Chapter 648, Teamwork On the top floor of the beige building belonging to the patrol team, a middle-aged man in a thin black suit heard Jenna's voice. Without bothering to trace the source of the shout, he stood up abruptly and retrieved a white human skull, seemingly carved from crystal, from his hidden pocket. The man, a mix of Intis and West Balam lineage, held the crystal skull and recited a mysterious language with a strong sense of death. In the next moment, a decaying palm extended from the void in front of him. Its joints were thick and its skin was bleeding, revealing signs of decay. The palm belonged to a corpse that looked vaguely human but, upon closer inspection, resembled a monster. Over 1-8 meters tall, its face concealed by a rusty bronze mask, and its torso composed of corpses from various species, including lions, tigers, black wolves, baboons, giant serpents, vultures, and humans themselves all in a severe state of rot. The corpse's bronze mask flickered with dark red lights in its eyes as it took a step forward, arriving in Camus's office. Faced with Camus, who had a revolver in his right hand, staggering toward his forehead, the monstrous corpse removed its bronze mask. Underneath the mask, there was no nose, flesh, or bones. Only two dark red balls of light and a mouth that occupied four-fifths of the head. The mouth opened wide, revealing a pitch-black interior. A terrifying suction force emanated from the mouth, affecting Camus's spirit, but having no effect on the documents, newspapers, and other items on the desk. It only caused Camus's spirit to surface, as if pulled by an invisible force about to be plunged into hell. As Camus's spirit body materialized, the grayish-white clown seeped out of his flesh, revealing its complete form a magnified, illusory poker card. The poker card had no body of its own and was swiftly drawn out by the pitch-black mouth beneath the bronze mask. Camus's spirit body struggled. Smack! The poker card materialized and fell to the ground, emitting the sound of a heavy object colliding with solid bricks, but there was no metallic sound. In the Matani import and export shop, the male bathroom lay in ruins. The door and the wall facing the corridor crumbled into fragments, scattering for several meters, as if a storm had passed through. The bottle of fiction had lost its effect. Amidst the residual fragments of light and the lingering sulfur smell, Twanaku rolled out in his devil form. His pitch-black skin bore hideous wounds and his flesh seemed to evaporate. Half of the two curved goat horns on his head were gone and viscous black liquid flowed from the cracks. The bat-like wings on his back were tattered and drooping. With Twanaku's formidable physical strength, the hurricane of light from the pride armor shouldn't have caused such tragic and severe damage, but he was a devil. The hurricane of light possessed the unique ability to destroy evil creatures and undead beings. It was like Twanaku undergoing purification while being sliced by a fragmentary blade. What made it more potent was their collaboration. Purification weakened defense and inflicted harm on the evil creature's spirit and flesh, while the fragmentary blade utilized purification to weaken defense and cut through flesh. The more wounds and the deeper they were, the better the purification effect. Had Twanaku not resisted in his devil form and instead transformed into a wraith, he might have faced severe injury, teetering on the brink of death or even elimination. The hurricane of light could vanquish wraiths and injure evil spirits. Despite being severely injured, Twanaku, still capable of combat, calmly suppressed his tyrannical and bloodthirsty emotions. Realizing he had escaped the seal, he prepared to transform into a wraith and escape through the surrounding mirrors. Just as he made this decision, a sudden sense of danger premonition struck him. The malice came from behind, and in the shadows outside the bathroom, Franca, dressed in an assassin suit, emerged, raising her left hand. On her left thumb, she wore an iron-colored ring with a thick band and a surface covered in small spikes ring of punishment. 
Franca's lake blue eyes flickered with lightning, moving many times faster than the fastest bullets, shooting out silently with psychic piercing, hidden blade. Why do I only sense her malice now? The severely injured Twanaku couldn't dodge in time and suddenly heard an illusory shattering sound. The shattering sound echoed from Twanaku's spirit body and intense pain flooded his mind, compelling him to raise his hands to cover his head. Seizing the opportunity, Franca swiftly took out a mirror and reflected Twanaku in his devil form. Black flames ignited in her left palm as she smeared it across the mirror's surface. Demoness's curse, black flames erupted from Twanaku's body, but nearly two-thirds were suppressed by his flesh and blood, leaving only a portion of the colossal devil's spirit body to be incinerated. Being a devil immune to curses to a certain extent helped Twanaku endure the demoness's curse better given his already ravaged state from the hurricane of light. Finally free from the influence of psychic piercing Twanaku, with his spirit body engulfed in black flames, transformed into a pitch-black, viscous liquid. These liquids seem to originate from the darkest corners of the human heart, representing the most sinister and shadowy desires and emotions. Twanaku abandoned Wraith form, choosing Desire Apostle's Desire Incarnation because Demoness's black flames targeted the spirit body more. Before the pitch-black viscous liquid could fully elongate into a human figure, he fled into the nearby darkness, sensing a strong danger premonition in his heart. At the corridor's entrance, Anthony Reed, donned in military, green attire, appeared in a blind spot. His eyes took on a faint golden hue, transforming into vertical pupils' psychological invisibility. Frenzy. Twanaku's mind buzzed, instantly breaking free from his desire incarnation state. Bloodshot eyes and liver mortis appeared on his body, emitting sulfurous blood. He entered a frenzied state. Already grievously injured and subjected to psychic piercing and the demoness's curse, he was on the verge of losing control. Rumble. Light blue sulfur fireballs pelted the surroundings, propelled by Twanaku's wild instincts. Franca's form quickly shattered into mirror fragments, while Anthony's body sprouted grayish-white dragon scales. He leaped toward the wall for cover. Rumble. Using up Franca's mirror substitution, Lumion teleported behind the frenzied Twanaku. Having already unleashed the accumulated spirituality and strength within him, Lumion's spirituality surged, no longer drained. Enduring the scorching sulfur flames and the blast's impact, Lumion focused on the oblivious, frenzied Twanaku. He harumphed. Two beams of white light shot from his nose, hitting what appeared to be Hisoka. Twanaku collapsed, and the signs of madness began to fade. Lumion didn't allow him to reach the ground. Extending his right hand, he grabbed Twanaku by the shoulder and teleported him into the spirit world. In seconds, Lumion materialized at the edge of the primitive forest near Port Pylos. Even during this process, he let out a harumph. The pale, yellow light emitted from his mouth knocked Twanaku out again, preventing him from regaining consciousness. At that moment, a woman stood at the edge of the primitive forest. It was Hela, dressed like a black widow, but not as distant as before. Observing Twanaku, no longer in his colossal devil state, but emitting a sulfuric scent with dark patterns on his skin, Hela nodded at Lumion and said, It should be Hisoka. Every time Hisoka participated in the curly-haired baboon's research society, he only disguised himself superficially. If Hisoka's true identity was targeted Hela, who was responsible for providing the gathering venue and entrance method, could still recognize him. Ha! Lumion chuckled and added a new spell of harumph to Hisoka. Hela seized his arm and chanted an incantation. The two of them, along with Hisoka, vanished like pencil drawings erased by an eraser. In the ancient and dilapidated palace of the Nation of the Evernight, as Lumion emerged from his concealed state, he harumphed. Two beams of white light descended, and Hisoka remained unconscious. Hela's tone chilled as she remarked, I'll let you enter the same dream. Thank you. Lumion released Hisoka, reclining against a broken stone pillar. Moments later, his thoughts blurred until he heard Hela's voice. It's done. Lumion snapped back, 
gazing into the interrogation room where Hisoka sat opposite. This member of the curly-haired baboons research society, Twanaku Tupian, bore light brown skin, a blend of northern and southern continent descent. His eyes gleamed flaxen, his hair dark. While not unattractive, his demeanor exuded indifference to life. At the sight, Lunian's lips curved into a smile. He had sought Hela's assistance primarily to craft an environment where he could safely unveil his plans after capturing Hisoka alive. Otherwise, restraining Hisoka's resistance would have posed a significant challenge. Communicating with him would have been impossible if he remained unconscious until his demise. Destroying Hisoka's frontal lobe would strip away frustration, pain, and resentment, making it difficult to fulfill the requirements of the Reaper ritual. Upon spotting Lumion, Hisoka suddenly struggled, but an invisible force held him back, preventing his transformation into a wraith. This was a dream controlled by Hela. Hisoka calmed down and gazed at Lumion, posing the greatest question on his mind. How did you manage to evade my danger premonition? Lumion's smile deepened. He looked down at Hisoka and said casually, No need for a demon hunter's assistance. A sufficient distance and a hypnotist would do the trick. Chapter 649, Conspiracy Showcase Sufficient Distance and a Hypnotist Hisoka repeated Lumian's words as if he had realized something. Lumian stood in front of him, looking down and questioned, Do you think that, apart from demon hunters and higher-level bayonders of the corresponding pathway, devils mainly get killed based on chance encounters in battles? Hisoka regarded Lumian with indifference and remained silent. Lumian pulled up a chair and sat down, crossing his right foot over his left knee. Casually, he said, I've read a mysticism book about devils. It's filled with numerous cases of hunting devils. It's clear that bayonders of most pathways rely on chance encounters to kill specific devils. That's what I believed back then. However, when I revisited the detailed description of devil abilities, I found a contradiction. This is how the mysticism book describes your danger premonition. Danger premonition, also known as malicious perception, if an enemy can soon cause lethal harm to a devil and takes clear action to do so, a devil can sense the danger in advance and grasp the source. They can target it, kill it, take revenge or escape, but it's impossible to know the exact details of the plan. Different devils have different intuition ranges from a few minutes to a day, from a few kilometers to as wide as a city. What's the contradiction between this and a battle encounter? Hisoka asked, sitting upright, cold and curious. According to this description, devils can indeed sense a battle encounter, Lumian said with a smile. For example, even though I only intended to have a cup of coffee today and suddenly encountered a devil and had no choice but to kill him. For that devil, it's literal. He should have sensed that my coffee drinking at the cafe would pose a fatal danger to him in advance and that it would happen, but that's not the case in reality. Observing Hisoka's thoughtful expression, Lumian clasped his hands together. This means that a devil's danger premonition doesn't stem from fate. If it were a powerful bayonder of the monster pathway, there's a high chance they would suddenly feel that coffee isn't suitable today and avoid danger. But you can't. Since a devil's danger premonition doesn't stem from precognition of fate, where does it stem from? Once, a high-ranking demon enlightened me about the concept of the abyss. According to its perspective, the abyss holds two dimensions. The first is physical, with an entrance hidden somewhere in the real world. The second is in the mind, with an entrance nestled deep within everyone's hearts. Considering this insight, I believe we need to tweak the foundation of a devil's danger premonition. It kicks in only when an adversary has a well-defined plan capable of inflicting fatal harm on a devil soon. That's when the devil can sense it beforehand. Got it? A more distinct thought process or intent. Lumian adopted the cadence of Madame Magician to taunt Hisoka, weaving the narrative of his conspiracy. In the beginning, I probed bit by bit and investigated step by step. When I stumbled upon crucial information, I purposely skirted around it, leaving me in the dark about who I was dealing with and without a rough plan to handle the target. 
In simpler terms, I didn't have clear thoughts or intentions, and there was no effective plan to cause lethal harm to you anytime soon. Everything was vague, chaotic and uncommitted, filled with variation and accidents, ensuring you couldn't naturally sense danger. However, your position alerted you when I delved into the serial murder from four years ago. Since then, you've been using a Wraith's ability and the patrol team members under your control to keep a vigilant eye on this matter, right? Hisoka listened coldly, showing no intention of responding. Lumian smiled and continued. After figuring out that you were hiding in the patrol team as a zombie sequence bayonder, I resisted my urges and tried my best not to dwell on such matters. When I returned to the hotel, I immediately teleported to Trier. At this distance, you won't be able to sense that I'm formulating a plan and putting it into practice. After coming up with a preliminary plan, I went to Hidden Blade and my two other companions to discuss a detailed plan. It was just past 7 p.m., trier time. The next move involved assigning tasks. Each of us had a role to play. We underwent a hypnotist's hypnotism, erasing our true purpose from memory. Only when a devil like you emerged would we recall the specific details. My mission was to use teleportation, making it seem like I left, only to return stealthily using shadow concealment. I trailed the patrol team member I interacted with believing that I was checking if there was anything problematic with him. Hidden Blade's mission was to tail me, providing necessary vigilance and support. If I activated the Bottle of Fiction ability, she'd preemptively don the Ring of Punishment and lie in wait outside. The reason for her ambush eluded her until she laid eyes on you. With her combat prowess and intelligence, she instinctively knew what steps to take. No need for me to give detailed instructions. The hypnotist's mission involved using psychological invisibility to wander the vicinity, just aimlessly wandering. As for the other demoness, her duty was to monitor the patrol team and promptly report any issues to the authorities. Before your arrival, she too was unaware of the real reason behind her actions. She simply thought we had plans involving the patrol team. Before the hypnotism wore off, none of us had intentions of confronting you. Our individual actions couldn't pose lethal harm to you, ensuring you couldn't foresee it. This was a premeditated encounter, a clash pitting you against multiple adversaries. With that final sentence, Lumian suddenly heard an illusory shattering sound. He sensed that his conspirer potion had been fully digested. He also felt Hisoka's seemingly cold expression, vexation and regret growing, gnawing at his heart. Lumian's smile widened. He stood up, leaned forward, and inched his head in front of Hisoka. He looked into Hisoka's bloodshot flaxen-colored eyes and said, Your biggest mistake was not leaving Port Pylos ahead of time and sticking with the patrol team. Why are you so certain I won't track you down? How do you know I enjoy Fermo coffee without sugar? Hisoka inquired instead of answering. Sensing his intense anger and killing intent, Lumian straightened up and replied with a smile. My sister always says that wherever you go, you leave a trace, and I have an expert at finding traces with me. Ha <laughs> ha, Emperor Roselle must have said something similar. You must know what it means. Kasoka's hands tightened on the chair's armrests as he asked again, Why were you so sure I'll kill Kolobo? Lumian replied with a sense of satisfaction, I wasn't certain. Didn't I mention I had a demoness companion monitoring the patrol team? Hidden Blade and I believe that if you ultimately choose to escape, you will definitely do something to vent your murderous desires. Otherwise, something might happen to you, considering your devil and prisoner pathways, and since you want to kill someone, it's either the patrol team member who traded with me or Camus who gave me the information. It's either at the Matani shop or in the patrol team. At this juncture, Lumian guessed with a smile, you took the gamble of staying in Port Pylos and the patrol team because you wanted to seize an opportunity to kill me. Under the watchful eyes of the Tarot Club and curly-haired Baboons Research Society, finding a chance to eliminate a promising young man like me and escape unscathed can satisfy your twisted mind to the fullest extent. Hisoka subconsciously licked his lips. I initially planned to bide my time, 
waiting for your patience to wear thin and an opportune moment to present itself. But it seems you didn't seek the assistance of the demigods. You only reached out to Hela. I should have struck last night. Hisoka didn't conceal his frustration. Lumian didn't immediately address the topic. After a few moments of contemplation, he said, Waiting for an opportunity, you're quite confident in concealing your identity, unafraid of normal investigations. Is it because the higher-ups of the patrol team allowed a sequence six of the prisoner pathway to join? Hisoka sealed his lips, responding with silence. Seems there's a significant secret lurking here. Lumian suddenly sensed a conspiracy. Is the opportunity you're waiting for connected to this secret? Hisoka maintained silence, his eyes transformed, now bloodthirsty and filled with a desire to kill. Not willing to share, Lumian chuckled. No problem. Let's discuss something else first. He bent down again, looking at Hisoka. In this operation, I sought only Hela. Firstly, to guard against the noise family demons who had made contact with you. Secondly, to create an environment for a quiet conversation with you. At the mention of the noise family's demons, Hisoka's gaze subtly shifted. How do you know? Lumian didn't reply. The corners of his mouth curled up even more. I chose Hela because I wanted to capture you alive, relying on my own strength and that of my companions. Each of us is weaker than you, and each of us is someone you think you can easily kill. However, as a team, through teamwork, we've put you in a tight spot. You'll descend into hell. Hisoka shattered the chair's armrest, but he couldn't attack Lumian. Observing his bloodshot eyes, Lumian retrieved a golden straw hat from his traveler's bag, pressed it to his chest, and bowed. I'll excuse myself for a moment, he said with a smile. In the next moment, Lumian left the dream. Swiftly shifting his sitting position, he leaned against a broken stone pillar. From his traveler's bag, he retrieved Gardner Martin's Bayonder characteristic, teeth, blood, colorful bearded horned lizard's venom, hornbeam essential oil, and other items. He had genuinely sensed Hisoka's fear, anger, and frustration. Although it occurred in a dream, it was reflected in Hisoka's brain and body, real and intense. He was about to concoct the Reaper Potion. Chapter 650, Reaper In the ancient, crumbling palace of the Nation of the Evernight, Lumian carefully poured Gardner Martin's blood into a measuring cylinder and added the unusually sharp, small white bone blade that emitted a cold light. During this process, he moved swiftly, paying no attention to the bone blade shaped beyonder characteristic slicing his fingers and causing blood to flow. Instead, he ignited crimson flames, helping the wounds contract and preventing the white bone blade from entering the potion with his blood. The physical pain heightened Lumian's clarity and excitement. He added Gardner Martin's two teeth, the colorful bearded horned lizard's venom, and the hornbeam essential oil into the bright red blood. Bloop! Bloop! Bubbles bubbled in the blood, and the items mysteriously dissolved. Soon, black iron dregs emerged from the bright red blood, as if an iron weapon had shattered inside. Lumian glanced at the still slumbering Hisoka Twanaku, picked up the measuring cylinder, and poured the liquid into his mouth. The pungent smell of blood, the unfamiliar taste of rust, and the burning sensation instantly filled Lumian's mouth and pierced his brain. It felt like being caught in a chaotic war, constantly facing blades, firearms, and relentless enemy assaults. Wounds appeared all over his body, throbbing with pain. Son of a so, am I being attacked by a potion? Lumian muttered, bewildered, as he found himself locked in combat with a swarm of oncoming adversaries. Fireballs, fire ravens, and blazing white spears shattered, tore through, or impaled the enemies, turning them into torches that illuminated the battlefield. After an unknown span of time, Lumian felt his strength waning, his spiritual energy on the brink of exhaustion. The accumulated spirituality of an ascetic had long been unleashed. In that moment, a colossal figure materialized before him, radiating a formidable and intimidating aura. Despite Lumian's weakening state, he sensed the colossal figure's fear, hatred, and frustration. He's afraid of me, Lumian realized suddenly, 
Summoning the last shreds of his courage, he condensed a blazing white flaming spear and hurled it at the colossal figure. A blinding white flame erupted, piercing through the colossal figure's head. Rumble. The giant figure exploded from within, shattering into countless fragments. Rumble. The entire battlefield crumbled. Lumion shook off the daze and found himself in front of a crumbling ancient palace, its stone bricks weathered by time. Hisoka Twanaku still slumbered, and Hela stood silently by his side. Sweat dripped from Lumian's body, bursting into crimson sparks. Eventually, the sweat returned to normal. Phew. Lumian let out a relieved breath. His spirituality was rapidly recovering. He had advanced to become a reaper. Having completed the ritual of capturing a higher sequence enemy alive and revealing his conspiracy, Lumian had consumed the potion and advanced to sequence 5, a Reaper of the Hunter pathway. Compared to his previous sequences, Reaper bestowed three additional abilities. The first, Weakness Investigation, allowed Lumian to discern the target's vulnerabilities and weak points in their defenses from a mystic perspective. The second call could be infused into any attack to harvest the target's life. Any part struck by call was akin to an assault on vital points and weaknesses, dealing significant damage. If call hit a genuine weakness or vital point, it could deliver a fatal blow, making it challenging for the target to withstand three consecutive attacks. It could even inflict real damage on demigod-level creatures, provided they didn't block or successfully evade and refrained from using mystic defenses. The third, Precision, enabled Lumion to precisely target a predetermined location and manipulate fireballs, fire ravens, and other spells that had left his body. He could split a colossal fireball into hundreds, striking different targets with precision, achieving effective area of effect damage. It was a far cry from a blanket explosion being more efficient and effective. Both Cull and Precision demanded a substantial amount of spirituality, rivaling Lumion's current usage of teleportation. The exception was the combination of Precision and Fire Raven, as Fire Raven could allocate a bit of spirituality and was easily manipulated. Even with Precision, its consumption of spirituality wasn't significant. Lumian also felt a significant enhancement in his spirituality. His mind cleared and his life force intensified. He could compress flames to a blazing white state in an incredibly short time, merging with flaming spears and swiftly covering dozens to hundreds of meters. Ignoring the spirituality consumption, he could travel using this method. While Lumian's strength, speed, and physique had improved, he was still not resilient enough to withstand a bullet with his body. At the entrance of the mostly collapsed male bathroom in the Matani import and export shop, the silver-white full-body armor burst out, wielding a light condensed hammer in both hands. It searched left and right, but couldn't locate its target. Gradually, it seemed to calm down. From a nearby shadow, Franca emerged, her eyes assessing Colobo within the half-collapsed bathroom. His life wasn't at risk, but his injuries were significant, and he appeared weakened. He'll be Pride Armor's next target, Franca thought quickly. Seizing the moment while Pride Armor was still on the lookout for the backstabber and hadn't chosen a new target, she swiftly approached. Franca grabbed the motionless silver full-body armor and deftly stowed it into her traveler's bag. Meet up with Jenna, Franca called out to Anthony, positioned outside the corridor. In an instant, she melted into the shadows, disappearing from sight. Surveying his newfound abilities, Lumian felt a surge of delight. Is this Reaper? If I were to confront Hisoka now, breaking through his defenses wouldn't be a concern. My craving for combat and slaughter has intensified. Having adapted to the changes in his body, Lumian turned to Hela and expressed his gratitude. Thank you. Hela, not seeing any cause for gratitude, sighed and commented, Your team's teamwork is impressive. Madam Hela, the ritual has succeeded, but I wish to enter Hisoka's dream again and inquire about something else, Lumian requested. Hela nodded in agreement. The ritual requires him to remain lucid. He might lie, but the questioning doesn't need him to be lucid. 
As she finished speaking, Lumian suddenly closed his eyes, slumping to the ground against the dilapidated stone pillar. The corners of his mouth remained curled up, and his expression gradually turned calm. In the dream's interrogation room, Lumian took a seat across from Hisoka and addressed the captive, whose malice and desire to kill were no longer concealed. Thank you for your help, I've become a reaper. Hisoka, leaning forward, seemed to forget that he could attack. So what if you're a reaper? In a duel, I'd still kill you easily. If you hadn't joined forces with Hidden Blade and relied on numbers, you would have been dead. No longer lucid, he's finally revealing his true thoughts in the dream. Lumian chuckled and responded, If I can create an opportunity to fight with numbers, why should I face you one-on-one? -on -one? My companions are also a part of my strength. Hisoka spoke with malice. Do you truly trust that hypnotist? It's very dangerous to open up your body and mind to a hypnotist. Aren't you afraid that he'll take the opportunity to leave some hidden cues that will unknowingly bring you under his control? Lumian gazed at Hisoka for a moment before breaking into a smile. Perhaps that's why I defeated you. No wonder Mad Lady said you weren't pure enough. Firstly, I do trust him. We've been through life and death together. Secondly, I'm willing to take such a risk to kill all of you. Straightening up, Lumian locked eyes with Hisoka, enunciating each word, Even if I plunge into the abyss, even if I descend into hell, I shall witness your tragic demise. Hisoka fell silent. Lumian eased back into his seat, composed himself, and casually inquired, I learned from devilology that a devil requires a ritual to advance to desire apostle. It's best if it's a special serial killing ritual. However, other than the one four years ago, there's only been one in Port Pilos recently. Furthermore, I've already killed the murderer. How did you advance? With a boon? You couldn't have become a desire apostle four years ago, could you? Hisoka responded with a smile. Just because you don't know doesn't mean it didn't happen. Lumian's heart stirred. Was one of those two pranks to cover up your advancement ritual? Lumian ventured, drawing from the scattered information he had gleaned from the peripheral members of April Fools. They were like scattered pieces of a puzzle, each offering a fragment of the truth but lacking the full picture. The tales spoke of chaos unleashed, a disappearance of gold in the depths of Devise, and a clash between townsfolk and a primitive tribe in Tizimo town, resulting in tragedy. Lumian suspected that Hisoka's advancement ritual had been shrouded within the chaos of Tizimo's prank. Hisoka's eyes sparkled with approval, his tone paternal. You're quite perceptive. Lumian seized the moment to shift the conversation. What's up with the noise family's demon? He treaded cautiously, sidestepping the celestial worthy and the mother tree of desire for now. Hisoka's expression turned cold. I aim to utilize him to acquire something and carry out a ritual to appease him repeatedly, but he only formed a connection with me. He only granted me an opportunity two years ago. Something. Two years ago, the pranks in the gold mine city and the town of Tizimo took place after this. One happened at the close of the preceding year, while the other unfolded at the close of last year. Lumian started suspecting that these two pranks might have motives beyond concealing the advancement ritual. Before he could delve deeper, Hisoka asked vehemently and frenziedly, Why didn't you seek the Tarot Club's assistance this time? Lumian arched his eyebrows and inquired with confusion, Why does it matter to you? Even without the Tarot Club's aid, I could have successfully dealt with you. The novel will be updated first on this website. Come back and continue reading tomorrow, everyone.